I'm going to open with a story, which will hopefully explain my somewhat unusual title. Uh, so I earned my PhD in 2010, uh, and shortly thereafter joined LIGO. I was a postdoc at Northwestern, um, and one of the graduate students there, Ben Farr, he's no relation of mine, but we're frequent collaborators, so it's a bit confusing. Ben Farr was making a plot, as one does as a graduate student to show the postdoc, here's this cool thing I've been doing. And he opens up a terminal window, and he fires up Python, and suddenly it's colors. And he starts typing things, and, and little autocomplete tips come up, and you know, documentation for the functions is appearing as he's typing, and I am just gobsmacked. And that, of course, was IPython. Um, and the reason I'm telling you this story is because you know, all of these tools, Jupyter among them, that everyone here likes to use, really burst on the scene. From my perspective, it feels like at the same time that gravitational wave astronomy was accelerating and growing and becoming the big thing that it is now. And so they sort of grew up together. And everything that I've learned about them has been because some cool kid like Ben has said, hey, look at this, and there we go. So most of the plots that you'll see in this uh, talk were produced with matplotlib. Many of them were done in Jupyter notebooks that we share around amongst ourselves internally and also externally. And at the end of the talk, I'll give you a website where you can download data from the LIGO detectors, notebooks that will teach you how to use that data, how to run analyses on it just like we do, and even produce some of the plots that you'll see today. So what is LIGO? I am a member of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. It's uh, of order a 1,000 astronomers, physicists, engineers, computer scientists across the globe. You can see the logos here. Um, and as you would imagine, coordinating such a thing is a bit of a herding cats problem. Um, and it's very helpful to us to be able to share efficiently results of calculations, computations, et cetera. And Jupyter and this open source uh, universe of computational tools that's grown up, that it's a part of, is a big part of what makes us successful and is very useful to us in communicating our results to our colleagues. Um, you may have heard of LIGO. It was recently in the news. Three early members of LIGO, the founders of the, the group, won the Nobel Prize in 2017 um, for their work getting conceiving of the experiment and the detector uh, and planning the early physics and shepherding the growth of uh, the, the collaboration and also the instrument to the phenomenal discoveries that, um, that happened. Um, so I said, Gravitational wave astronomy is a young field. Well, astronomically, it's young because it's only been going for 40 or 50 years. But in terms of results, it's also very young. It really kicked off in 2015. I'm showing you a plot here. This is September 14th, 2015. And we'll just focus on the top two panels. That is a data readout from two LIGO detectors, one in Hanford, Washington, one in Livingston, Louisiana. Um, and the Livingston plot also shows the Hanford data in slightly lighter color uh, in back of it. And the noticeable thing here is there seems to be a signal in the detectors. It grows over the course of about a tenth of a second, oscillates up and down, and then dies away. And it appears coherently in the two detectors very nearby in time. That is a gravitational wave. It was the first ever gravitational wave detected. We call the source GW150914 because imaginatively, that's the date. Um, we know, one of the reasons we know it's a gravitational wave is we saw it simultaneously in two detectors that are across the United States. Another reason we know it's a gravitational wave um, comes from the second row of panels here. Um, and in, in that row, there are three curves shown, and they, I think, they both show the physics, but they also highlight sort of the sociology that I want to talk about here. Um, the, the widest band there comes from an analysis conducted on a supercomputer in the traditional physics way. You submit a batch script, it gets shipped into a scheduler, fires off a bunch of jobs, they communicate through MPI, etc. And the widest band tries to reconstruct the signal that was in common between the two interferometers. That's it. Just what do I see that is consistent in both interferometers? And you can see it tracks the data in each interferometer well. That tells us there was something coherent happening in the two. It's a little bit hard to see, but the next most narrow band is, again, a supercomputer calculation. 
But here, it uses decades and decades and decades of research into analytical approximations to solutions to the general relativistic field equations that describe merging binary black holes. So this is the kind of thing that you can write down the formulas for that curve in a few hundred lines of computer code. But they're meant to approximate the solution to these partial differential equations in three space and one time dimension. And that band is the range of reconstructed signals that are permitted under that approximation. You can see it tracks the data really well as well. That suggests this is a pair of merging binary black holes. The final curve, the solid red line, is hundreds of thousands of CPU hours of numerical solutions, direct numerical solutions of Einstein's general relativistic field equations. And that is, as best we can determine, the real signal that binary black holes would produce. One of them weighs 30 times the mass of the sun. The other one weighs 40 times the mass of the sun. They're about the size of Manhattan. They crash into each other at about half the speed of light. And that curve tracks the data really well as well. OK. What are these detectors? How does this all work? Okay. I'm not going to try to give a physics lesson here, but there's going to be a little bit of physics. You'll have to excuse me. I'm an astrophysicist. So I showed you a data stream, but where does it come from? It comes from Hanford, Washington, and Livingston, Louisiana. Two detectors. The detectors are interferometers. But really what they're doing is they're measuring distortions in space and time. We now know, thanks to Einstein, that gravity is really distorted space and time. And just like one produces electromagnetic waves by wiggling charges, you wiggle a charge, the disturbance propagates in the electromagnetic field, it wiggles charges in an antenna which go into a receiver and out comes music. Okay, that's electromagnetic waves. You wiggle masses, it perturbs space-time, that disturbance propagates in the space and time fields, it arrives at your detector and wiggles masses, and you read out the result. So what we have built here is a space and time measuring device, which is really just some freely hanging mirrors, and when the wave comes through, the mirrors move. And all of the laser interferometer um, technology, which is phenomenal, and I don't have time to spend any time on it other than say it's phenomenal, um, goes into just measuring the length of those arms to a precision that's about 1 1,000th of an atomic nucleus. So this device is four kilometers long, okay, it's miles long, um, and we measure the motion of the end pieces to 10 to the minus 18 meters. And that is the signal that's recorded here. So LIGO uh, observed after the 1509-14 event for another three months and recorded 1.9 more signals. Um, one happened just after Christmas uh, of 2015, and one that was probably but not certainly a gravitational wave. This one we think has a, about a 95% chance of being a gravitational wave. Um, that one happened in October of 2015. And then LIGO turned off. Improvements were made. It got more sensitive. It turned back on in 2017. And we recorded two more signals, one in January, one in August. And in fact, we published a third signal that happened in June. And then last August, something happened. So this is showing all of the signals and, and a, a, a final signal that came in August 17th. And of course, the first thing you notice is that one is much longer. The other signals are a few seconds. This one is 50 seconds, 60 seconds, 100 seconds. That signal is the signal you would expect not from merging black holes, but from merging neutron stars. Why is that cool? Well, black holes are made of gravity. When they merge, they make a whopping big gravitational signal and nothing else. So for traditional astronomers, see, I get to call myself an astronomer now because we've seen sources. Previously, I would have said I'm a physicist or an astrophysicist. But traditional astronomers, the kind that use regular telescopes, they look at light, electromagnetic radiation, and they don't get anything from black holes. But neutron stars are made of matter, so when they slam into each other, they can make light. And this system did make light. In fact, this is the title of a paper, Multi-Messenger Observations of a Binary Neutron Star Merger. That means gravitational waves and electromagnetic radiation. 
LIGO has about 1,000 people in it. This paper had 3,000 plus authors and was one of some 60 papers that appeared coordinated in their release on the day we announced this event, almost two months after we saw it. The analysis and observations here involve something like a third of the global astronomical community. The event was detected within a day of the gravitational wave signal. In fact, we saw gamma rays from it two seconds after the gravitational wave signal, proving that light and gravity travel at the same speed to fantastically good precision. But in the optical, those six panels that I'm showing there are from different instruments, and you can see inside the cross there's a little bright dot. I'm not showing it to you, but if you'd looked at that part of the sky a week earlier, you would not have seen that bright dot. That bright dot is the explosion that resulted when the two neutron stars slammed into each other, again, at near the speed of light. And by analyzing the properties of that, we now know these events, which spew out neutron-rich, right? Neutron stars are made of neutrons. Spew out high-density, very hot, neutron-rich matter form basically all of the heavy elements, um, including gold, uranium, Everything heavier than iron in the universe is probably formed from these sorts of mergers, and we know that now. Another fun thing you can do, if you have light as well as gravitational waves, the strength of the gravitational waves tells you how far away the event is. We know how bright neutron stars are intrinsically in gravitational waves. From the amplitude of the signal we receive, we can calculate the distance. If you have light, you can measure a redshift. So you might be familiar with Hubble's law. This is a plot from Hubble's original paper. Hubble is famous for many things, but among them, noticing that as he looked at more distant galaxies, this was in the early 20th century, people had just realized there was a whole universe out there, the Milky Way was just one galaxy in it. When you look at these more distant galaxies, they seem to be moving away faster, as if the universe were expanding. And of course, today we know the universe is expanding, and its rate of expansion is called the Hubble constant, in honor of Hubble's discovery of the phenomenon. If you can measure a distance, that's the thing that goes on the x-axis of this plot, and a velocity, a recessional velocity, by looking at red-shifted lines in the light, then you can make this sort of plot, and the slope of that line is the Hubble constant. It tells you the age of the universe. It tells you the size of the universe. It's a fundamental property of the universe. And we can do that with gravitational waves. So here is Hubble's plot on the top, and then on the bottom, the little square shows you the distance range over which Hubble was operating. Now, gravitational waves stretch much further, and our first measurement shows up right there in that cross. It was at about 40 megaparsecs. That's 120 light years away. The recessional velocity was measured from the electromagnetic radiation, and we calculate the Hubble constant to be about 70 in units that astronomers like to use. Now, we actually already knew that. There are lots of electromagnetic observations that give you the Hubble constant. And if you take the range of slopes of that line and you turn it into a plot, you get this plot. The blue curve there gives you what we think the probability density is for the Hubble constant. It peaks at 70, but it could be 90, it could be 60. Those two bands are competing electromagnetic measurements, and they are currently much more precise than our measurement. However, they disagree. One of them looks at the early universe and measures the size of the universe and gets one answer, and one of them looks at the nearby universe and measures the size of the universe and gets a different answer. As gravitational waves, as more gravitational waves from these events are detected, that curve will narrow, and we may be able to choose between the early universe and the local universe measurements, and that could be a hint to new cosmological physics. And to bring things back around to Jupiter as I'm closing, this is just a screenshot in case you were wondering. Almost all of these plots, as I said, are made, in, made and shared in Jupyter Notebooks. That's a screenshot of the Jupyter Notebook that produced the plot that I was just showing you. And if you want to see more of them and you want to play with LIGO data and you'd like to run tutorial notebooks or run notebooks that reproduce our actual analysis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's called the LIGO Open Science Center, and there it is. Thanks very much.